NET presents USA Poetry. This program is devoted to the work of Philip Whalen and Gary Snyder. The only printed biography of the poet Philip Whalen is very brief. It reads, born Portland, Oregon, October 1923, U.S. Army Air Force, 1943 to 1946. Reed College, Bachelor of Arts degree in Literature and Languages, 1951. Although Philip Whalen is frequently identified as a poet of the Beat Generation, the character of his life and work has little resemblance to the sensational publicity that has become associated with the term Beat. Oh, I work all the time, actually. That's one of the curses of poetry, is that uh, uh, you don't get a day off or working every day. Uh, and. Uh, most of the night because a lot of the times I'm dreaming things and I will write them down later and put them into a story or into a poem. So it's a 24 hour day job and it goes on all the time. Frequently oh, Philip Whalen's books contain pages from his notebooks and examples of his excellent calligraphy. Your attention gets scattered with boiling tea water or, or with worrying about the war or, or about a hundred million other things, and uh, you wander away from what I think of as, as being the basic uh, necessities or basic realities of, of existence. I walk uh, usually every day and then I go out through Golden Gate Park or, or go out downtown to the library or walk down to North Beach and see people there. Or walk up here on the hill uh, to the top of uh, Mount Olympus or to look at the weather and look at the light. I, I love the light here in San Francisco, the way it flattens out across everything uh, and lights it up from different angles and, and the way the whole landscape changes when the clouds go over it. You don't start being a poet, you, you get born that way. <laughs> That's all. It, it, Poet and nascitur non fit, or whatever Mr. Horace said about that. Uh, I suppose that uh, the first, uh, one of my first poetical experiences was uh, uh, that of that of having my appendix burst and and having an op having an emergency operation and and being in the hospital the first time and having an ether vision uh, uh, of uh, of great enlightenment and also a physical experience of light as as itself and uh, um, a feeling of, of the total uh, a, an odd feeling of total the total meaningfulness and and rightness of of existence and and, and so that was one thing that happened another thing that happened was a, was a some sort of small satori vision or whatnot one day when I was old four years old, uh, I came into the room where uh, my toys were usually kept and, and there was sunlight coming through French windows onto, onto a hardwood floor. And there was something about the relationship between those windows and the light and the floor and the closet where the toys were that all uh, made a funny kind of poetical breakthrough. To, to my head that I always remembered. Uh, and it also connects, of course, with that ether vision that came a little later. And uh, uh, that and a lot of other experiences without any other, without ether or anything else, just, just of walking around and looking at things and listening to people and, and watching, watching the world and uh, ha have, all, have all gone into a habit of, of hearing and seeing that, that is the basis of poetry, or is actually poetry, because after all, poetry is a description of, of this high kind of, of consciousness of, and, of, and of understanding, I think. And, and uh, uh, it, with any luck at all, when the person reads the, the stuff, he'll get some feeling about that, that existence or that, that understanding or that excitement. Uh, I often uh, uh, use a reading to to uh, test out poetry that, that I've been working on recently uh, and uh, quite quite often I'll read brand new things out of reading that haven't been published or, or, or sometimes aren't even typewritten yet. I'm still reading from a handwritten manuscript 
to see where to see if the poem is really there or not and to to see also whether it gets across to to a, a an audience or to a, a prospective reader or whatnot and also I can t it tests out on my own ear that way and and uh, ultimately all my poems are are an ear things I, I hear them internally and and uh, compose them uh, they compose themselves and I compose on them sort of like music is done I suppose the California Palace of the Legion of Honor is a San Francisco museum that has many of the works of the French sculptor Rodin. Since this location is more or less on the Whalen walking route, it's not surprising that he has written a poem titled Homage to Rodin. The poem was published in 1962 in the magazine Foot. Thinker in the classic Paris style shows up in old New Yorker cartoons, appears in some houses as plaster bookends. A great animal the biggest goon Rodin could find for a model, or magnified him. I think most Frenchmen are small by nature. Animal, for sure. We customarily think man, human, soul, confronted with this kind of creature, I, we, and so forth. Concomitant fantasies of art, politics, religion. Rodin says animal, who sits down, which is one difference, apparently doing nothing to calculate, cerebrate. And that's of the first significance. Meet, thinking, and got hands to build you what he means or throttle you if you get in the way. Either action without too many qualms. Hands, feet, arms, shoulders, legs, Rodin says. We're in the habit of thinking man, subject for the psychiatrist. Old stuff, we say, Rodin, Rilke's employer. Oh yes, Rodin, but after all, Archipienko, Arp, Brancusi, Calder, Henry Moore, sculpture for our time. That is, they appear in Harpo's Bazoo, modern, chic, seriously discussed in vogue, Epstein and Lipschitz are out, the heroic Tejas as Rodin. Nobody knows what it is, hulking, beefy, nude, we all the time wearing clothes and arguing quest for values. Forget what we are, over busy with who, the only time we sit still is on the toilet, and then most of us read. The only quiet and private room where we have bodies we wish away. Rodin, body with head containing brains, hands to grab with, build possibly, the physiologist says, hands helped enlarge the brain, feet to come and go, buttocks for sitting down to figure it out. How isn't it wonderful? How is it base materialism? Why? Do we insist there is nothing we can do? Two, Land's End, the Shades. I won't go to the park today, informal prospects, groups of noble trees, play land at the beach instead. You never saw a merry-go-round go so fast. Two fat old men watch it from a bench. One sings words to the tune everyone else forgot. No amount of sympathetic observation will do any good. Why not get older, fatter, poorer? Fall apart in creaky amusement park and let the world holler. Softly shining pewter ocean, or let it quit, who cares? The road to the Palace of the Legion of Honor still broke. About a thousand feet of it don't exist. I walk along the edge above the fog horns and dim fish boat passing the rocks, anise and mustard, pine trees and fog. Formal building, pillared propylon and stoa, honneur et patrie, Apse and dome and Greek pantheon life-size. A few golfers look at them. Just below the apse, Fort Miley steel fence. Empty concrete bunkers, coast artillery, no defense. No more meaning than the gods, a wonder of expenditure. The whole outfit, stone, marble, pipe, organ, and all built by a single family, given away, more or less. Nobody home but Cezanne. Amusement, high-class park to remember dead soldiers and the late Monsieur Rodin. No amount of reflection on the noble, prospectless dead, no amount of indignation does any good. They are blanked, puzzled looking, the shades. They stand, heads bent down, three arms pointing toward the ground that covers them, young, burly ghosts wondering. We like to kill each other. We like to grab with both hands, with our teeth and toenails, 
Unless you've got sharp teeth and toenails, you end up watching the merry-go-round. Not even a dime for popcorn nor anything to chew it with. Then there's a quote. Everything was all right until that man came along and we decided to be kind to everybody. That's the trouble with this. Now we're too kind. We ought to kick them all right in the ass and stay home and mind our own business, which is being mean as hell. Fat kid wants expensive camera daddy to put two bits into Cliff House binoculars. His father screams in reply, furious, insane. What do you want to look at them rocks? What do you want to see in this fog? Come on, the fat kid hollers. Give me 25 cents. Put 25 cents in. Give me 25 cents. I want to see them rocks out there. Is Come on. Give me 25 cents. And his father screaming back at him like he might tear the kid limb from limb, actually looking in another direction, quite relaxed. There's all this loose hatefulness rolling around. We spend all our time hating the world, the Russians, the government, the job, the noise, the cops, our friends, our families, and ourselves for not changing, rearranging not being able to find what to change or what we'd use to do the job. A woman plays in the surf, tight jersey pants, a kind of sweater top with sleeves, fully dressed, but the water doesn't hurt her clothes. Oblivious to her girlfriend hollering at her from the sand at the foot of the stairs, she plunges, laughing, through a wave. Part three, water lilies and iris. Fog washing past Mount Sutro, Parnassus, the medical school, a mirage, that city in the sea. Leaves over the sky where these water lilies grow up through my mind. Flowers in the water, not to be reached or touched. Pool of enchantment, pink granite curbing says before the young museum. Short reeds in shrubby island, Hiawatha boy blows flute at cougar pair, one crouching, one sitting, their ears laid back and chanted. Black water, thick mud at the bottom, lily bulbs, head in the dark, pattern of stars inside, buried lights. First a few lobed circles on the water, then leaf mountain with pink pecker buds, open flowers, unmistakably women that never fade nor wither. Impregnated, they withdraw beneath the waves. No mystery, genes in every cell manifest themselves, bulb of the earth showing itself here as lilies. The summer flowers, Underwater globes of winter, all the same. Since you'd gone, I hadn't thought of other women, only you alive inside my head, the rest of me ghosted up and down the town alone, thinking how we were together. You bright as I am dark, hidden. Inside the museum, I see Rodin's iris, torso of a woman, some sort of dancer's exercise, left foot down, toes grasping the ground, Right hand clutches right instep, right elbow dislocating, reveals the flower entirely open, purely itself. Unconscious, all concentrations on the pose, she has no head. Its light blasts all my foggy notions, snaps me back into the general flesh, an order greater than my personal gloom, frees me. I let you go at last, I can reach and touch again, summer flesh and winter bronze opposite seasons of a single earth. In 1959, Philip Whelan was asked to write a statement about his own work. The result was a press release titled, Since You Asked Me. Since You Asked Me. This poetry is a picture or graph of a mind moving, which is a world body being here and now, which is history and you. Or think about the Wilson Cloud Chamber, not ideogram, not poetic beauty, bald-faced didacticism moving as Dr. Johnson commands all poetry should, from the particular to the general. Not that Johnson was right, nor that I'm trying to inherit his mantle as a literary dictator, but only the title, doctor, that is, teacher, who is constantly studying. I do not put down the academy, but have assumed its function in my own person, and in the strictest sense of the word, academy, a walking grove of trees but I cannot and will not solve any problems or answer any questions. My life has been spent in the midst of heroic landscapes which never overwhelmed me, and yet I live in a single room in the city, the room, a lens focusing on a sheet of paper or the inside of your head. How do you like your world? Gary Snyder is another poet identified with the Pacific Northwest, San Francisco, and Reed College. Snyder now lives in Kyoto, Japan, where he is a student of Zen. But for part of 1965, he was a lecturer 
in the English department at the University of California at Berkeley. When asked to ad lib a biography, he gave his usual direct answer. Well, I'd, I'd have to tell the truth. <laughs> I was born in San Francisco, and uh, at a very early age, I was moved to Seattle, where I grew up on a small farm uh, just north of Seattle. Uh, later, about 12, we moved to Portland, Oregon. I went to college in Portland, Oregon, uh, graduated from Reed College, spent a little time at Indiana University, and then came back to the Bay Area. I went here to Berkeley in the Oriental Languages Department for uh, about three years, and um, then for the last eight years, I've almost constantly been living in Japan. Gary Snyder's poetry readings are exceptionally popular. All of the emphasis is upon the poetry itself, and the readings are as plain and simple as his Japanese student's uniform. As a poet, I hold the most archaic values on Earth. They go back to the Paleolithic. And all of science and civilization, so-called progress, never has and never will improve on them. These values are the fertility of the soil, the magic of animals, the power of vision in solitude, the terrifying initiation and rebirth, the love and ecstasy of the dance, the common work of the tribe. My poems are about work, love, death, and the quest for wisdom. What we have is the ground beneath our feet, our minds and bodies, the man and woman who bore us, the man or woman we live with, the children we have made, and the friends we know. First, I'd like to read a couple of poems from my first book, Rip Rap. Rip Rap, here in the West, means a cobble of stone laid on steep rock to make a trail for horses in the mountains. The two poems I'm going to read from this book were written after I had been working for the Park Service on a trail crew in the high country of Yosemite National Park. Pay for the horses. He had driven half the night from far down San Joaquin through Mariposa up the dangerous mountain roads and pulled in at 8 a.m. with his big truck load of hay behind the barn. With winch and ropes and hooks, we stacked the bales up clean to splintery redwood rafters high in the dark, flecks of alfalfa whirling through shingle cracks of light, itch of hay dust in the sweaty shirt and shoes. At lunchtime under black oak, out in the hot corral, the old mare nosing lunch pails, grasshoppers crackling in the weeds. I'm 68, he said. I first bucked hay when I was 17. I thought that day I started, I sure would hate to do this all my life. And damn it, that's just what I've gone and done. Above Pate Valley. Pate Valley is in the northern section of the Yosemite National Park. We finished clearing the last section of trail by noon, high on a ridge side, 2,000 feet above the creek, reached the pass, went on, beyond the white pine groves, granite shoulders to a small green meadow watered by the snow edged with aspen, sun straight high and blazing, but the air was cool. Ate a cold fried trout in the trembling shadows. I spied a glitter and found a flake, black volcanic glass, obsidian by a flower, hands and knees pushing the bare grass, thousands of arrowhead leavings over a hundred yards, not one good head, just razor flakes. On a hill snowed all but summer, 
a land of fat summer deer, they came to camp on their own trails. I followed my own trail here, picked up the cold drill, pick, single jack, and sack of dynamite. 10,000 years. This section is called the market. Especially it refers to the old Crystal Palace market in San Francisco, the beautiful public market in Saigon, the public market in Kathmandu, Nepal, and the market along the Das Aswamed Ghat in Banaras. The market. Heart of the city, downtown, the countryside. John Muir, up before dawn, packing pears in the best boxes, beat out the others to market. The Crystal Palace on the morning milk run train. Me, milk bottles by bike, Guernsey milk, 6% butterfat, raw and left to rise natural, 10 cents a quart. Slipped on the frost turning into a driveway and broke all nine bottles. That was when we had cows. A feathery hemlock out back by manure pile where one cow once lay with milk fever, transfusions and worries until the vet come, we do this still dark in the morning. Part one. To town on high, thin wheeled carts, squat on the box top stall, papayas, banana, sliced fish, grated ginger, fruit for fish, meat for flowers, French bread for ladle, steamer, tea giant, rough glaze earthware for brass shrine bowls. Push through fish, bound pullets lay on their sides, wet slab, watch us with glimmering eye, slosh water. A carrot, a lettuce, a ball of cooked noodle. Beggars hang by the flower stall. Give them all some. Strong women, dirt from the hills in her nails. Valley thatch houses, palm groves for hedges, rice field and thrasher to white rice, dongs and piastres to market the changes. How much is our change? Part two. Seventy-five feet hold rows equals one hour explaining power steering equals two big crayfish, equals all the buttermilk you can drink, equals 12 pounds cauliflower, equals five cartons Greek olives, equals hitchhiking from Ogden, Utah to Burns, Oregon, equals aspirin, iodine, and bandages, equals a lay in Naples, equals beef, equals lamb ribs, equals patna, long grain rice, eight pounds, equals two kilogram soybeans, equals a boxwood geisha cone. Equals the whole family at the movies. Equals whipping dirty clothes on rocks. Three days, some Indian river. Equals piecing off beggars two weeks. Equals bootlace and shoelace. Equals one gross inflatable plastic pillows. Equals a large box of pity for a short cram. Barley threshing. Mangoes, apples, custard apples, raspberries equals picking three flat strawberries, equals a Christmas tree, equals a taxi ride, carrots, daikon, eggplant, green peppers, oregano, white goat cheese, equals fresh-eyed bonito, live clams, a swordfish, a salmon, a handful of silvery smelt in the pocket, whiskey in cars, out late after dates, old folks, Eating cake in secret, breast milk enough if the belly be fed, and wash down, hose off aisles, reach under fruit stands, green gross rack, 
meat scum on chopped blocks, bloody butcher concrete floor, old knives sharpened down to scalpels, brown wrap paper rolls stiff push broom back, wet spilled food. When the market is closed, the cleanup comes, equals a uh, billy goat pushing through people, stinking and grabbing a cabbage, arrogant, tough, he took it, they let him cut mandu, the market. I gave a man 70 pice in return for a clay pot of curds. Was it worth it? How can I tell? Three. They eat theses in the dark on stone floors. One-legged animals, hopping cows, limping dogs, blind cats, crunching garbage in the market, broken fingers, cabbage, head on the ground. Who has young face, open pit eyes between the bullock carts and people, head pivot with the footstep, passing by, dark scrotum spilled on the street, penis laid by his thigh, torso turns with the sun. I came to buy a few bananas by the Ganges while waiting for my wife. Now, the rest of the poems I'm going to read are all from an uncollected, unpublished collection of poems which will be called The Back Country and which will be dedicated to Kenneth Rexroth. These are all shorter poems of the last six years. This is called A Cabin in Marin County. Sun breaks over the eucalyptus, grove below the wet pasture, water's about hot. I sit in the open window and roll a smoke. Distant dogs bark a pair of calling crows, the twang of a pygmy nut hatch high in a pine. From behind the cypress windrow, the mare moves up, grazing. A soft, continuous roar comes out of the far valley of the six-lane highway. Thousands and thousands of cars driving men to work. We won't be white men a thousand years from now. We won't be white men 50 years from now quite. And the whole society is going someplace else. I feel that this is one of the most exciting works of poetry right now, is to, is to capture and make contact with those areas of the unconscious that belong to the whole um, American continent, the non-white world, the world of mythology and in intuitive insight that belongs with primitive cultures, and ultimately getting back in touch not only with ourselves, but with the natural world, with nature, which we've been out of contact with so long that we've almost destroyed the planet. Gary Snyder's poem, The Market, is from a work in progress titled Mountains and Rivers Without End. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.